house. Hey, welcome to Thursday Church. For those of you joining us online, we are so glad, woo me, so glad that you are with us wherever you find yourself today as we study God's Word, and we, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look at several different scriptures, open up God's Word together, and we are going to grow. That's the whole point of our gathering together. We are on part two of our series, Don't Plug Your Ears When Jesus Is Talking, and this particular series came about when Pastor Jason, one of our associate pastors, heard his five-year-old daughter speak those words. And for a year, we've been joking and talking about what would it look like to turn that line into a sermon series. And so we've actually done that. We are on week two of this series. And, and last week, what I found when we introduced this line and the sweet little voice of that five-year-old saying, don't plug your ears when Jesus is talking, we went, oh, that is so precious. Isn't that sweet? And then the more spiritual of you said, out of the mouths of babe comes praise, you know? So here's the thing. It's actually a very profound statement. And it's something that just because it sounds very elementary, we don't want to jump past it. We want to wade into it. We want to absorb that thought. What does it look like when we're turning a deaf ear to what God is asking of us, teaching us, enlightening us, calling us to? What does it look like to put our fingers in our ears and say, you know what? That one's tough for me. I, I, I can't hear that particular message. Love your enemy. You don't know what my enemy has done to me. We, we put our ears in, in, in our fingers, or our fingers. We really don't put our ears in our fingers. We put our fingers in our ears. When, when we say, but Jesus, you want me to forgive seven times 70? Do you understand the offense? We plug our ears because some of these things are hard for us to hear. When the Lord says, keep yourself holy, and you say, ah, well, this is just some entertainment on the side. You know, there are things where we decide to just plug our ears to, to Jesus. Instead of crying out to him, we're saying, I don't want to hear that particular message because it's challenging. So our focus this week and and our, our study notes, that study note group meets down at Gracie's 5.30 on Tuesdays if you want to join them. Our focus this week is that there is a big difference. A huge, ginormous, magnificent difference between simply hearing someone speak and truly listening to what they are saying. See, we get in the habit of when someone starts speaking to us, we get in the habit of already thinking that what we have to say is far more important than what they are saying. And so while they are talking, we are already thinking up our dialogue, how we are going to speak into them. So we're not even really listening. We're hearing them, but we're thinking, but this is what I'm going to say when you get done talking. And so we, we aren't truly listening. And we, we sometimes do this even with Jesus. I know if you have a spouse, <laughs> you're familiar with this tactic. Um, I'm, I am really good at it. My husband, Mike, uh, sometimes he'll be just chatting along, and I'm not listening to a single word. But I pretend I am. Uh, last Saturday, he was telling me how filthy the high school football uniforms were. And he was going on and on and on about how filthy they were, how, you know, they'd played in the mud. For those of you who don't know, our middle son happens to be the head coach at Lincoln High School uh, for the football team. And our oldest son uh, uh, coaches the defensive line. I think that's what he does. And um, so, in other words, we're pretty invested in football. But, you know, I've been doing football now for a very long time because our dudes started playing when they were teeny tiny and I'm really sick of filthy dirty football uniforms to tell you the truth and so Mike decided he wanted the team to look really good this year he knew we had a lot of stiff competition so he wanted us to at least look good so he said I will wash the uniforms and I remember thinking you're nuts because I'm not helping you <laughs> not gonna do it and so on this particular Saturday and the uniforms were muddy he was telling me all about 
the laundry dissertation that we go through. You know, got to pre-soak, got to treat, got to scrub. And he was having a hard time on, on uh, last Saturday. And I'm just really not, not paying any attention. But I'm smiling and nodding my head. And I'm thinking about the grocery list and everything else. And then I hear this most bizarre thing come out of his mouth. I think I hear this bizarre thing. But I wasn't listening. So I wasn't sure. But I said, did, wait a minute. What did you just say? What did you just say? Did you just say you're taking those uniforms to the car wash? <laughs> He's like, yes, I think it's a very good idea. You're not listening to me, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> not listening to a word. He was disappointed, you know, because this is important to him. And, blah, 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 blah. and <laughs> I just wasn't listening. Folks, we don't just do that to our spouses. We do that to Jesus. He speaks to us, and there are times it's like, mm, I'm so busy with life. I got all this going on. I don't have time to hear that message that you are speaking to me. Or, or something that you really want me to particularly digest right now. I just don't have time for that. And see, if you aren't sure or not, whether you're truly listening to Jesus, here's the way you're going to know that. Are you making adjustments when you read his word? Are you making adjustments to your life when you hear someone speaking the word of Jesus into you? Are you making adjustments or are you just, just hearing but not letting it soak in. Are you applying these things to your life? See, if we aren't making adjustments when we are exposed to God's word, if we don't feel some conviction, if we don't have this determination that what I just heard needs to be applied in my life, chances are we're hearing without truly listening. When we listen, there is a desire to apply uh, to be transformed, to be renewed, to be restored day after day after day. To continue to grow in grace and this deeper relationship as we apply God's word to our heart. Uh, James 1, beginning with verse 22 says, uh, Don't just be hearers of God's word, but you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. If there is a, if you really want to make me mad, call me a fool. I hate that term. And yet, if we are just hearing without truly listening, we're fools. Verse 23. For if you listen to the word and, and you don't obey, it's like glancing in the mirror at your face. You see yourself. You walk away. And then you forget what you look like. But if you carefully look into the perfect law that sets you free. That's a powerful word, folks. When we are truly listening to the word of God, it sets us free. Free from the bondage of sin. Free from the heartache of, of, of walking outside of his perfect plan for our life. Free. But when you carefully look into the perfect law, it sets you free. And if you do what it says, in other words, you hear it, you listen, and you apply. You don't just stop at hearing. Too often we just stop at hearing. You hear it, you listen, and you apply it. And you don't forget what you've heard. Then God will bless you for doing that. And we're told that he will, he will shower us with his blessings when we are applying his word to our life. That means there's change that has to happen. Transformation that has to happen. This expectation that when I set before the throne of God... 
There is this expectation that he is going to call me to something new today. I love that way of approaching God's word. That when I open my Bible, I open it with this expectation that he's going to speak to me with power. And he is going to lead and guide and continually transform me. This is a continual process. Hebrews 10.10 tells us that it is God's will that we will be made holy. When I was going through the ordination process, uh, uh, Hebrews 10.10 happened to be the verse that they chose for me to speak into. And I remember when they said, okay, tell us your view on Hebrews 10.10. My heart instantly started to race. And, 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 And I was so nervous as I looked at these men in their suits And there I sat, men can be intimidating, you know. So here I sat and and I realized that I had this opportunity to claim what I truly knew God was speaking into my life, that we are not just sanctified at the moment of our, our accepting his mercy and grace. Yes, we are, but that sanctification continues on day in and day out. And that can be a complicated process to think through, but what that means is I am being made holy every single day. And as I walk in this gift of sanctification, this holiness that he has poured upon me as I receive the blood of Jesus Christ poured out for me daily, daily, I can expect to be transformed and renewed and that I can continue to grow in his grace. I've said it a million times, a million different ways, because it's so important for us to just grab hold of this thought. Folks, it's not about how much we know. Christians spend a lot of time wanting to make sure they know that they have this information. But if they just hear it and they're not truly listening and applying it, we are not moving forward with that transformation that takes place daily. It's not about how much do you know. It's what are you doing with what you know? What are we doing with that? When God speaks to you in your quiet time, what do you do with it? Do you just say, well, that was sweet. And then go on about your day doing exactly what you did the day before? He desires for us to grow, to listen, to not just hear, to not just acknowledge, yeah, I know you're speaking, God. But but I want to go beyond just hearing you speak. I want to absorb it. I want to apply it. I want to listen with a heart that's ready to be transformed and changed. Amen? Let's look at John chapter 10. That is page uh, 892. And um, as, as, as we're listening to the words of Jesus, when he uses the word shepherd, he's speaking of himself. When he uses the word sheep, he's speaking of us. Uh, and not just the peop- people of the first century. He's speaking of us right now because this is the living word intended to speak to, to all generations for all times. And since I really don't see among us today a shepherd, someone in full gear uh, taking care of sheep uh, this day. And I probably, um, I'm probably not aware of anyone in the room who grew up herding sheep as a child, as one of the daily chores was to go out and herd the sheep and, and care for the sheep. So, so since we don't have that insight, it would be really easy for us to lose the analogy that Jesus is making here and just, just not totally grasp uh, the depth of what he's talking about, about a shepherd and the sheep. And so we don't want to do that. So, so we're going we're gonna to do a little, uh, a, a, a little background on the shepherd and the sheep so that, uh, so that we grasp the power of this relationship. If a shepherd takes his sheep, his flock, out to the pasture... And there's something that that shepherd sees that could be harmful to the sheep. Say there's a, 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 a pile of thistles or something that could be harmful. Or say there's a big a, a ditch and it's, it's deep, but it's, it's kind of narrow, but they could fall. What the shepherd will do is he will direct one particular sheep and he will, he will hold the stick and kind of push it against the sheep to get the sheep to jump over the problem. All he has to do is get one of the sheep to jump, to leap. So he gets the first one to leap. And do you know what all the rest of them do? They follow suit. 
And they don't just jump where they're at. They take turns getting all the way up to that one specific spot where the first sheep took a leap. And they all leap at the exact same place, at the exact same height. But here's the thing. The shepherd is no longer there because he only holds out the stick for the very first one. That's all he has to do. He just has to get one, and all of the others will follow suit. It demonstrates this desire for the flock to be connected to one another, to be obedient to what the shepherd has instructed. They don't stand there and go, are you kidding me? My legs are longer than yours. I can get right over that. I can just walk right over that. Uh, uh, dude, I don't have to jump. They don't, they don't debate whether it's really necessary. They don't have to say, well, it was just that color sheep that was jumping, so I'm not going to, I'm a different color sheep, so I'm not going to jump. You know, no, no, it's this sense of community. And what one does, they're all going to do. And they're going to do it to get, together because this is what's been asked asked by the shepherd. The shepherd has, has asked this, so without debate, as a team, uh, they, they function together, united. The flock is one body, one community. They depend upon each other, and they act as a group. Now look at John 10, starting with verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep. And do they know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father? So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He is willing to die to keep the flock healthy. I have other sheep too. You know who those other sheep are? Us. Way down the line, it's us. We aren't part of that chosen group of, 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 of Jews who, who the Messiah came to this particular group. We are now part of what is called the Gentiles. And, and he's speaking about us. I have other sheep too. They are not in the sheepfold. But I must bring them also. I must bring them also so they are part of the community, so they function together, so that they are unified, so they don't fight against the shepherd, but they obey the shepherd with, with respect and obedience. They do what is asked. They will listen to my voice, and they will be one flock with one shepherd. Jesus will go on from here and he'll do some more teaching about sheep over the next couple years of his life. But one of the things that he will do from time to time is compare sheep to goats. Because you see, goats, they are very independent. They will follow no one. They will not do what is asked of them. As a matter of fact, they will do the exact opposite. But sheep, the, the flock of sheep are settled and, and they are content when they are together together in one unified body as a flock. And, and I found this interesting. Sheep social distance. Ah, there you go. They, they stay about, about six feet apart from one another as they function and, and go through life. I hope we don't have to go through the rest of our life six feet apart from one another, but if we do, sheep are a good example. Do you know when they do huddle up? If you ever see a flock of sheep and they're all touching each other, they're all huddled up, that's because there are baby sheep. Uh, what are they called? Lambs. Thank you. I don't know why I can never remember that. But that's because those, those little lambs are protected in the center or the elderly or, or they are protected because there's something going on that the flock feels we need to come together and huddle up and, and protect the weak among us. And so that's when you see a flock all touching each other like that. It's for protection. These, these sheep have this mentality that we are one. We're going to take care of one another. That this mentality that if, if you say it's good to do, I'm going to do it with you. So if one decides to jump, they all decide to jump. If one decides to run, they all decide to run. If one decides to lay down, they all decide to lay down. If one decides to graze, they all decide to graze. If one decides we got to huddle up, they all huddle up. 
whatever one does, they, they do together. They're committed to one another. I think it is so important for us to understand why the flock has to have a good shepherd. You see, if there's a bad shepherd taking care of a flock, what will happen is the flock will develop bad habits as they follow a bad shepherd. And so they will do things that endanger the entire flock because the shepherd is not aware or being careful as that shepherd leads the flock. But here's the cool thing. All you got to do, all you got to do is change the shepherd and put in a few good sheep. And an entire flock will change from a bad flock to a good one in relative time. I mean, it's very quickly. It happens very quickly as they begin to follow the the good shepherd and these few sheep can change the complexion of the entire flock. Have you ever thought about where God's placing you? In the midst of of, of something that might not be good, have you ever thought that maybe, maybe you're there following the good shepherd to turn the tide? Not to to not to not to continue in the mess, but to change it, to bring healing, to bring enlightenment that this is who I follow, and then others just come along. You know, it turns out these creatures that seem so connected are actually not very smart. Left on their own, they just aren't very smart. So say if a sheep would see, mm, there's a morsel of food right over here, and it's in this, this thicket. I'm going to go into the thicket to get that morsel of food. And so in they go, they get what they want, and then instead of just backing out because they can, because they have the ability to walk away from what they have entangled themselves with, they just stay there. And they keep pushing forward, keep trying to move forward. When all they need to do is back out and get away from the danger, they won't do it. And they'll continue to stay there until they die. Till they die. Think about that one. If a sheep happens to get separated from the flock, that sheep will not eat, will not drink. It will walk in a big circle in search of the flock, and it'll just keep walking and walking and walking in a circle. It will not stop. It will walk until it dies. We've talked before about how sheep will will graze and graze in one spot, and they'll eat the grass all the way down to the roots. Well, this week I learned that these creatures not only will... eat down through the root, they'll stay right there and they'll keep eating the dirt. They, they won't move. This is not smart. When I get to the wrapper on a cheeseburger, I know to stop. I'm not going to eat that wrapper. They would. They just keep eating and they'll keep eating the dirt until they, until they die. If they see a puddle of polluted stinky, nasty water, and there's a fresh source of water right here, they won't necessarily go to the front. They'll go to whatever's right in front of them. And so if the polluted water's in front of them, even with a fresh source of water right next to it, they'll just drink that polluted water until they, until they die. You catching the analogy here? See, we don't know all these things about sheep, but Jesus did. And those shepherds and those, those people who grew up around sheep, they knew how stupid sheep were. They knew what sheep would do. And so it was kind of insulting when Jesus is saying, see, we don't take it as an insult. We take it as, he's our great shepherd. The reality is what he's saying is, you guys are foolish on your own. You're going to die without me. You will die a spiritual death. These sheep. These sheep, (laughs) 
It's us. And so that's why Jesus wants to make sure that we are not just hearing his words, but that we are listening and that we are applying his words as he compares us to sheep. One last thought about sheep. If you put a heavy load on their back, they can't carry it. They can't carry it on their own, and so they will die. Turns out sheep die in it very easily. One of the, I, I don't know, they just, they just give up and die. It's the weirdest thing. I'm, I'm having a trial. I'm having a struggle. I'm, I'm okay, dead. I, I just, I kept reading about all these animals dying. I was like, is this for real? They just die? Apparently they do. They need a good shepherd to watch over the flock and keep them healthy. And you know what the good shepherd does? He makes sure they are protected. He makes sure that they, they are safe because he wants the sheep to thrive. In Istanbul, Turkey, this is a true story. I, I looked it up. There's actually a police report connected to this story. In 2005, uh, some shepherds went off to have breakfast and left their sheep unattended. And while they were relaxing, having their breakfast, one of the sheep, because sheep are, are they just are stupid, it walked right off the cliff. He walked right up to the edge, looked, and then just clunk, off he went. And then do you know what the 2,000 sheep behind him did? Oh, wow. Oh, wow, they followed. <laughs> they followed. 400 of them died. The rest, they said, lived because they all fell in a pile. So there's actually a police report reporting that these shepherds had, had, had not been watching over their sheep. See, Jesus doesn't want us to fall off the cliff because we aren't smart enough to recognize that is sin and that will kill me. On our own, we will step into things that will kill us. And the bad thing is, people are following us. You have no idea the power, the influence that you have over your loved ones, over your friends. People are following you, like it or not. So you better be following a good shepherd. Matthew 13, uh, verse 12 reads, To those who listen to my teaching, more knowledge will be given. And they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken from them. Like it or not, we are like those sheep. We are going to be following someone or something. And this notion of being subject to, submissive to, following this shepherd. Jesus knew when he was saying this. See, this wasn't a sweet little message. This ruffled feathers because everyone in the first generation or the first, the, the first century, they, they understood what he was saying. He was saying, left on your own, you are going to die. He was saying, left on your own, you will not make wise choices. Left on your own, you will follow even when the one you are following is leading you astray. And you need a good shepherd. A shepherd who will protect you at all cost. A shepherd who literally lays down his life. When they say that term, lay down their life, they all understood. See, the shepherd would serve as the gate. Literally, laying down in front of the gate so that his sheep couldn't cross without him being aware. He would keep them safe, make sure that, a, that, that an animal or a predator couldn't come in or that somebody couldn't try to steal his sheep. He would lay down his life. He wants to promote goodness within the sheep. He wants the sheep to be connected to one another. He wants the sheep to feel responsible for one another. He wants them to function as a community 
A community, a community that brings peace and love and joy. A community that reflects that they have been forgiven. A community that says that we have received the grace of Jesus Christ. And this is what it looks like. And this is what it looks like for us to function together as a team leading those who don't know the Good Shepherd to the Good Shepherd. We have a big responsibility as his sheep. 